Good morning, Park Avenue Bible Church. If you have your Bibles, your phones with Bible on them, turn to Psalm 19. I want to read the first six verses from this psalm. The last month or so, the Lord has really been reminding me how much he speaks to us through the universe that he's created. And that's what Psalm 19 says. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the entire earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun. It bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race. The sun rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. And as we think about uh, God's being the son of the world also, those verses are true about him as well. We need to realize that God does speak through his creation. He doesn't need us to speak about him, but he wants us to. And he wants us to glorify him in all that we do, even as we meet this morning. Let's bow in prayer together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that although you don't need us to speak, you want us to. And it is important for us to do so, to bring glory to your name, to fellowship with each other, to worship you, and to honor you because of the love we share for each other. We pray this morning that you will bless all that we do. May it bring honor and glory to your name. May it enrich, enrich our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Am I on? I'm coming. If you want to open your bulletin, uh, we have uh, some announcements for you that we'd just like to highlight. We didn't get a chance to highlight last week. Uh, we, are, we are in the fall, and there's a lot of things starting, and so we wanted to just call your attention to those things together. So as you, uh, if you have kids, you'll know there is, uh, there's a lot going on in the morning here for you and for you as an adult as well. We're doing Sunday school, and we want you to, to be here. Pastor Joe is going to talk a little bit about that here right now. I'm sorry for taking your part. It's all good. Um, so, yeah, with our, our Sunday school, we wanted to help, especially you parents, to be more in the loop of what it is we're teaching. So if you look at your bulletins, um, there is going to be questions on the bottom left on the inside page that's in green. Um, so I'll get that in one second. But first, um, the curriculum, the way it is, we are able, they have parent resources for every single unit, every single lesson that we teach. And so if you're a parent here, I will be sending you an invitation. And you click the link, and every week you'll be able to see exactly what we're teaching on. And it'll have like a little recap of what it is we taught and uh, some activity or prayer times that you guys can do together as a family. And so I realize that may not, happen every week because we're we all live busy lives and so like when you are able to i'd encourage you to to keep on track with what we're teaching um but we also realize that sometimes life's just too busy and you don't have time to go through and plan a whole activity on what we learned and so that's why we've included these questions at the bottom at the very least we all have to get home after church and there's questions there of what ex that's three questions should be every week of what it is that your kids learn that they should be able to respond. But also, we know that sometimes it's going to be like, oh, I don't know. And then that will be just shut the conversation right down. So we've even given you the answers so that you can kind of help the conversation go so you, it, it doesn't stop with just one question. Like, well, that's too bad. Um, and also, during the service, we have uh, Sunday school 
for ages three to kindergarten. So that'll be right after the kids uh, feature. Um, and we're going to try to keep that s at least similar subject as to what we're talking about on Sunday. We probably won't be able to get it to match exactly up, but I'll at least be somewhat related so that you guys aren't learning totally different things. Um, and then the older kids will be able to stay in the service during that time. Some of you have noticed and commented that we haven't taken an offering for a while. And uh, I think that tradition is just going to continue as far as passing stuff through the sanctuary. We're not quite sure uh, where that falls in the appropriateness category. And, uh, and we are so grateful to you for continuing to support us. Uh, and so if you ch want to give to the church, we have the debit machine in the back. We also have a plate that's there in the back. And you're welcome to drop whatever you feel the Lord is leading you to give into that place. Uh, we will, uh, there are a lot of different ways you can give. You can give cash or check, the debit slip. You need to put that in there. You can have a pre-authorized donation, but we just will con we'll continue to refrain from passing something through the sanctuary, just so you know. Uh, we also do pray. Praying is a big deal at Park, and, uh, and we, uh, we have a call that goes, uh, goes around uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays, and that is, uh, I know it. Look, it's a crazy phone number there at the 425 area code, but it's free, and, uh, and you can just dial in, and we talk to one another, we pray with one another over the, over the phone. Uh, below that, on the left-hand side, you'll see a big blurb about home groups, house churches, we're going to continue to call them that. Uh, life group kind of has a bit of a, not a stigma, but it let, makes you think a certain thing. House church is what we did over the last 20 months, and we want to continue that. We want to meet together as church in the house. That's going to start on October the 10th, not the 3rd. Uh, we are going to bump everything a week uh, because of what we're, what we're living through right now. And, uh, and so October the 10th, we are going to start those. If you are, would like to sign up for one, they are, there are sign-up sheets on, in the back and on the right-hand side over here. And, uh, and we just encourage you, sign up for those. They're well worth your time. They're almost, they are essential to your growth in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And then uh, on the right-hand side of your page, you'll see Monday at 7, we have Bible study from basically anyone, 13 to 99. Uh, tomorrow, I will not be attending because I have, uh, we, we are going to be setting up for the memorial service. But uh, if, uh, if someone would like to volunteer to do that, who's been before, you're welcome to. And we'll, uh, uh, we'll send out a little text to tomorrow or something like that. Um, we're also starting up Club DJ this year, and so most of the details you'll need are right there. But registration forms can be picked up, I believe, in the bulletin board on the back. Um, and they'll need to be in quite quickly next Wednesday. Um, but you also don't, shouldn't need tons of time to just register. So once you've filled out your form, you can drop it off. And that'll be on whoa, Tuesdays, I believe, from 6.30 to 8, um, starting on... October 5th. Um, and then, yeah, if you have any questions, you can contact Jenny, and she's uh, kind of heading that up uh, from our end. So, um, yeah, it should go. I'm excited. It'll be really good to see kids together again. On Wednesdays, we're also doing Bible quizzing. Uh, so if you're in grades 7 to 12 and looking for a good way to help memorize Scripture, um, that's when they meet. You can contact John or Laura Lynn, if you're interested in that. And also, over the last year, we started something, basically we just call them parent nights. Basically, if you have uh, kids in the church, we'll invite you once every few months, come to the church and just have a time uh, to get together, hang out, talk, support one another, and learn a little bit about what it means to parent godly. It's not like uh, us teaching down on you. It's, uh, we want to encourage you and build you up as parents, especially over the pandemic. We saw that we didn't see parents and kids very much, and so we want to build you up and help you guys be the best parents you guys can possibly be. And then also on Thursdays, there's youth from 7 to 9.30 for grades 7 to 12. Um, and so every single Thursday, except for Christmas, we meet and we play games and we learn and we talk, and it's a really good time where we get to lift each other up and, and learn together. One more thing, and that will be on starting October the 13th, uh, we'll do our seniors Bible study. And, uh, and if you are a senior, 
or in denial about being a senior, you are welcome to come. All right? But just so you know, you're welcome to come. <clears throat> this morning is hard. And I just want to let you know that it's okay. I don't know if I've had something like, like what happened last week happen. And this is the first time we've been together, and honestly, it's felt like one gigantic day. It's hard to believe we're back here, honestly. So I just want you to know that, that I'm going to do this, probably, <laughs> all service. And I want you to know that it's okay if you do, too. Um, there's a lot of things going on. And so if you're singing and you <clears throat> break down while singing, got a handkerchief around your mouth, I guess, to dry the tears. But don't, don't shy away from doing that. It is 100% fine to not be fine today and every day. But please don't feel awkward if someone is breaking down in front of you. And if someone has to sit down while singing because it's too much, then pray for them. And if the worship team just can't sing because they're crying, then we sing too. But all of that stuff is okay today. And it's going to happen. And I just want to reassure you that, that it's fine. We're a family, and we feel it a lot more than we normally do. So I'll call the worship team up, and we'll pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. And Lord, our hearts are broken. And a lot of spirits have been crushed, and a lot of tears have been shed, and it's hard to believe that a week has gone by. But Lord, we just thank you that we can be together to worship today. <clears throat> we just want to pray for the Taylor family. Lord, we weep with them, and we mourn with them, and we ask that you would comfort them. We pray that you would be close to them. And we, we, Lord, we know that in our weakness you are strong. And so, Lord, today we lean on your strength. And we need you. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. free to stand. I choose to worship. I choose to bow. Though there's pain in the offering, I lay it down. Here in the conflict, when doubt surrounds, Though my soul is unraveling, I choose you now. I will praise you through the fire, through the storm and through the flood. There is nothing that could ever steal my soul. In the valley, you are worthy, you are good when life is mine.
dad and you know how much we're hurting right now as a body and God we just we just come before you and I just pray that you will just bear fruit within us God that your word will not be void that it will go out and that it will produce fruit and I pray that people from this tragedy can hear about the gospel Lord and father I just pray that that you will be glorified in our worship this morning you know our hearts Jesus and I pray that your name will be lifted up and God, we just give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. When peace like the Sorrows like sea billows
just so glad, you guys. I'm so glad that we have a hope in Jesus. I'm so glad that we have um, him as our strength, that we can lean into him when things are hard. Praise God. Praise God for that. This next song we're going to do was a favorite. Steve is our home church leader. The Taylors don't sing very much. <laughs> but uh, he liked this song, so we're going to sing it for him. great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night and through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my Lord.
scripture I want to read is from Isaiah 55. And um, it's talking about David in this, in this scripture. But it says, See how I used him to display my power among the peoples. I made him a leader among the nations. You also will command nations who do not know you. And people, peoples unknown to you will come running to obey. Because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord, for he, he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Let's sing here that our last song.
stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. We make a miracle work. Promise keep a light in the darkness. My God, that is who you Okay, there you go. All right. I've been up here. So I'm John Hess, and I just want my privilege today is to uh, inter introduce and interview a little bit Daryl and Joan Evans, who are with us from, are one of our supported missionaries from that we, that we support as a church. And um, I thought to myself, you know, we actually support a number of missionaries in our church, um, and a number of them are actually named Evans. So I thought to myself, well, because we support... Daryl and Joan, we support Gordon and Judy Evans. We also support Kevin and Janice Evans. So I thought to myself, I'll let Daryl sort out all the interrelationships of Evans's that he can tell us how they all work together. Well, once upon a time, we were all members in this church, and then you began to give us money and told us to go away. <laughs> so we went away. My wife and I, we went to Bolivia, South America, then to Chile, and we came halfway back to New Mexico, USA. My brother, he went over to Africa with his wife and family, and they're still there until May of next year. And then Kevin and Janice, they were even more involved here, and you sent them off to British Columbia, and they're at the Falkland Bible Camp out there, and we had a wonderful time visiting with them as well. So that's kind of how we're connecting, and we're wondering who you are. You, you don't look like the church people, at least most of you don't, that we left here when we went. But we do rejoice that we have one God, one Savior, and one Spirit who has kept us unified, and we truly praise God for your prayer support, your moral support, and sending a team down a few years back who helped us in ministry there, got plugged into some places and helping where there are social injustices. But hearing what we're singing today, hearing what we heard in the pastor's uh, class of Sunday school, we know your focus is staying on the gospel and seeing that it is the gospel that will bring 
healing the social injustices and so on. Well, that was a long answer to a short question, so I think we have 30 seconds left. I just thought, actually, for some of you may remember, in 20, 2016, we had a team go down from our church to New Mexico, and uh, where they were able to help out their own zone in their ministry. And I was t trying to remember all the people who were on the tour, but it's like Melody Little and Josiah Little and Marvin Dallas were on the team, and Pastor Phil went, and my wife and my oldest son, Ben, and Liam Davies, and there's Aaron Tosh, too. I think I've gotten everybody, so they're able to go down there and actually interact. And Jordan Whitney? Okay, good. There's one more. They're able to interact with them and be able to help out with a short-term missions team. Um, I noticed on the their director and office administrator for Bible studies by mail, and um, I just thought I'd let Daryl describe a little bit more about what that um, what all that entails. Am I going to talk to you, my love? Hey, one time, one thing that really hit me and has stayed with me um, was during the visit time, we had a little group gathering in the back where Pastor Phil and a handful of others were grading the message, the lessons of students. And Pastor Phil picked up a handful of envelopes and he's, of, of students' letters, and he said, this isn't paper. These are people. And that stuck with me. People are clicking on our website, and they're signing up for lessons, and they're being asked what they want to learn from God, from the Bible. And it's amazing what people say. It's amazing what people write on their paper. So the ministry of Bible studies by mail is predominantly lessons, correspondence lessons, going out through the mail. Some of you may have heard of the mailbox club ministry that happened right here in Melford, Saskatchewan, and it had a great effect. And some of you, including my wife, um, may remember participating in it. So what else do we do? Is it only through the mail? No, it's through the front door. Uh, we have a testimony or two or more of remarkable transformations that have happened through the Word of God in people's lives. We can't share all of that, but oh, if you could only meet a Dominique Betancourt, who is now Aragon. We walked her down the aisle, suicidal, three times, going for the fourth time. I invite her in. She ponders and looks. She goes a little further down the street. I say, my wife is in there. Come in for free coffee and Bible study. She stops. She's only 28. She looks like she could be whatever age, unclean. She comes in. Boom. Jesus did it. He changed that lady's life. All the social injustices that happened in her life and the horrifying things that were done to her as an innocent child. <sighs> Jesus healed her. He truly did. Now she is helping other girls who have suffered from what she suffered from. Some of it was innocence. Then she chose a lifestyle. She reaped what she sowed, yes, but she is shining for Jesus. The power of the gospel, don't let this pandemic shift your mind to cynicism, criticism, skepticism. Get your mind on Christ. Daryl Evans, preaching to the choir here. Keep it on Christ. Keep it on the gospel. That's the hope. You're singing it today. Love that last song, Living Hope. I think that was five minutes. Wow. Okay. Well, let me let me pray for you guys before we go here. So let's let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Daryl and Joan. Thank you for their ministry in in New Mexico and how it impacts so many different people, not just in that area, but all over the States, Canada, and lots of places around the world. And Lord, we know that your word is strong and powerful, 
And uh, I guess I just pray just for wisdom for Daryl and Joan as they open up these lessons and as they interact with people. And so often it's hard to know how to react to different things that are coming. What, what do people really need? And I pray that you give them your extra special uh, dose of wisdom to know how to respond and to meet, meet the needs that wherever they're at. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we go to our prayer time, we wanted to take some time and just give a little tribute to our brother. And I asked a few guys if they'd be willing to share. And it's not an open mic. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll actually have an opportunity tomorrow, or uh, rather on Tuesday, at the memorial for that. But, uh, but we did, I did ask for four or five guys if they want to come and share. And guys, if you, uh, if you feel like you're able to come and share, then now is the time. And I'll stand up here with you. So I've known Steve all my life, <clears throat> but it wasn't <clears throat> excuse me, until several years ago that we reconnected through the program called Celebrate Recovery. It was through our common struggles with addictions that allowed us to grow close. Throughout the years since, I've been blessed with many opportunities to serve God in various ministries alongside Steve, Steph, and my wife, Dallas. And what a gift that, that has been. Galatians 6, verses 8 and 9 says, But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. This is one thing that Steve excelled at. He never stopped doing good, no matter how tired or busy he was. If God gave him an opportunity, he took it and ran with it. And I've always admired that about Steve. His ability to love everyone is another character trait that I envied and admired. This past week, I've spoke to many people and read many comments about him. And it's just absolutely incredible the amount of people that felt Steve was their best friend. Just in the way he loved. It was amazing. This to me is a testament to the love that he showed everyone that, he, that knew him, whether it was only a short time or a long time. His love was the kind that if he saw a need, he would do something about it. A few years ago, some of you may remember, Steve started sporting a man purse. It was a great opportunity for me to tease him about it. And apparently Steve saw a need in my life. So out of his love and concern for me to be as cool and stylish as him, he came to my house on my birthday and gave me my very own man purse. <laughs> and it pains me to admit it. But he was right. That thing was awesome. <laughs> and I loved it until I lost it in the fire this summer that Dallas and I had. Uh, what I admired the most about Steve is the ability that he had to be the father and the husband that he was. I've met with many, many men over the last 12, 13, 14 years who have had struggles like I've had and like Steve has had. And it's not very common to have a man sit and talk to you and not once ever, ever complain about his wife. And 
that's just a testament as to who his wife was and is. is. And um, when your kids, especially teenagers, are willing to get up at 3 or 4 in the morning on a weekend to go fishing, that says a lot. A few years back, Steve had asked a few of us to mentor him spiritually. And while we did our best to explain passages and Bible theology to him, Steve truly mentored us in the application of it. His example will mentor us in our men's group and others for many years to come. When Phil asked me to say a few words about him this morning, uh, he told me to, to talk a little bit about what I saw in Steve and what I loved about him. And I can sum it up with one word. It's Jesus. I saw Jesus in him. And that's the only reason why he was able to be the man that he had become. Thanks. Steve had an incredibly powerful testimony. I'm sure many of you have heard it. But to me, his testimony was not anything but who he had become. Uh, his story made him able to connect with so many people, like Marv was saying. He was real, and he was vulnerable with everyone, too. Um, our house church... Uh, my mom and my sister had come, I think my mom twice and my sister once, and in those couple hour meetings, I think Steve had more impact on them than I've had in years. Our house church became real and vulnerable as a result of Steve, because that's how he led. Steve um, was a pretty caring guy. We opened our doors numerous times to find Steve standing at, at our front step with food. He made fish, he made smoked meat, and he was there to share it with us. Um, he had a huge impact on me. Last fall, we um, were going to have a hot tub night to share our testimonies. And... Uh, Last minute, I didn't get to be a part of that. Um, that was the night that my dad passed away, and Steve was there. Um, I will really miss his role in my life. So when Phil asked me to speak today, my first reaction was, no way. <laughs> Maybe I could sing a solo or something instead. <laughs> but as I thought more about Steve and who he was, I knew I just had to. Because Steve never passed up an opportunity to speak to others when he knew, even when he knew it was going to be uncomfortable. That was just who he was. He led by example. From getting up at four in the morning so he could spend time with God before his family got up to sharing his testimony in front of different groups of people such as our own church family or the Mustangs hockey team to, memor to memorizing the entire Sermon on the Mount. Steve always encouraged people to push themselves and their walk with Jesus and he was right there alongside them doing the same thing. I've known Steve for a pretty long time. Uh, there's roughly a 10-year age gap between us, so my early me earliest memories of him is uh, him teaching me Sunday school when I was 7 or 8 years old. Um, I also remember him coming down to Children's Church ch shortly after his quadding accident, which probably a lot of you 
who are older than me will remember. And it was quite a bad accident, and I just remember him sharing with us about how God worked to save him that day. And that is something that I've always admired about Steve, even from a very young age. No matter what happened to him, no matter the struggles he went through, he saw them as opportunities to tell others about Christ and what he has been doing in Steve's life. Over the past five years, I've had the honor of getting to know Steve on a much more personal level. Um, probably the first interaction was an email parenting group that Phil set up for those of us that didn't have time to meet in person um, on a regular basis. Um, and that's where I got to know his heart for his kids and began to admire his desire to raise his kids for God. Um, and then shortly after that, there was a, mar a marriage course that he and Steph co-led with Marvin Dallas. Um, Jenny and I had the pleasure of taking that course with him, and we got to see his deep intentional love for Steph. Most recently, I've been lucky enough to spend about the last three years in a small men's prayer group with Steve. Um, that is where I've really gotten to know him, grown to admire even more his love for his kids and his wife, and see his passion for sharing the gospel with everyone he met. As I scrolled through his Facebook page this past week, it was filled with comments from so many people that had known Steve, anywhere from being a childhood friend with him to having just talked to him on the phone about buying a few livestock panels. All had pretty much the exact same thing to say about him. He was a great man of God. I thought that was pretty cool. No matter who he was talking to, he couldn't help but share Jesus with everyone. Throughout this week, and as I thought of Steve, a passage of scripture kept popping into my head. I'd like to share that passage with you before you go before I go. <laughs> These two verses will forever remind me of Steve whenever I come across them, and I hope they remind you of him too. Paul is writing these words while looking back on his life as a follower of Christ, and I'm always blown away by the confidence in his words. If there was ever another person that I could confidently say these words about it, it would be Steve. And it's from 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And one other fellow is going to come share. I'm not going to wear my face mask. Why? It's not. You guys have to. You also stay because of you and what I wear. No, actually, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah? Okay. My friend Stevo, one word I'll use to describe Stevo for me was real. We could talk about our struggles openly, and just uh, you could be happy, you could be crying, you could be whatever, and it's just who Steve was, and he just felt real about it all. A verse I'd think about for Steve is "Iron sharpens iron." tell you a little story. I, I coached the Mustangs a few years back, and um, a few boys used to come sit up, up there with us and listen to the message, and one fellow named Alex Rondeau, he came to receive Christ as Savior, and uh, Steve-O asked me if he could talk to him, and um, I gave Steve the number for Rondi and that, and the kind of the funny thing about it, so Steve, he makes a phone call to Rondi. Rondi Rondo gives me a call, and he's just like, he's very French, and just 
anxiety is like really strong. And he's like, Dan, um, Stephen Taylor. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, he, he just phoned me. I'm like, okay. Uh, he wants to go for like coffee and he wants to like, he, want, he talks to me like he's my best friend. And I'm like, that's Steve. I said, you know, you got to get to know the guy and go for a coffee with him. And I don't know if they ever did go for coffee or not, but uh, it's just a funny story because Steve would just go out and touch someone or phone someone or he wasn't shy or scared or whatever and just laid it out there. So I just, uh, iron sharpens iron to me. And that's Steve. -o. Prayer is such an amazing thing and something that um, I'm so thankful that we could do and share together as a family. Um, as always, just like in our own lives, there's always just so many things to pray, pray for. So we will, you know, touch on our prayer corner today. The pastors and elders actually gave me the the theme or or the instruction to pray for the Gall family and the Taylor family this week. So instead of leaning into the Holy Spirit for a theme, I spent my time in silence and solitude really asking how, how I could best serve my family in facilitating this prayer time. And the Holy Spirit put on my heart that he really wanted us to engage in a prayer time uh, that engaged our hearts and minds. So we worship in truth and spirit. And it was beautiful to me because um, every conversation that I ever had with Steve and Steph was always about prayer. And Steve was always pushing me to ensure that we were allowing for the Holy Spirit to move in our congregation in prayer. And I'm always very grateful for uh, that mentorship that, that he gave me. So that's how I've tried to structure it today. So I'm just asking all of you to engage with me. So we're going to start with the heart on the Gall family side of the page. And I am going to push each of us to just feel a little bit of uncomfortableness one of the things I was sort of praying and crying out is, how do I lead prayer for a persecuted family that I've never met and that I've never experienced that kind of persecution? And what I really felt the Holy Spirit saying was to try to facilitate a way for the whole congregation to engage their hearts into this. And so what I'm going to ask is the left side of the room, or my left anyways, the left side of the room when I say to stand up and because we're wearing masks, I'll get you to put your hand on your head. I would have got you to put it over your mouth and I just want it to symbolize the silencing that's happening to the Gall family and persecuted Christians all around the world. So we'll put our hands on our head on the left side of the room to symbolize that extreme oppression that they feel on a regular basis. And while you're doing that, please just ask the Holy Spirit to help you pray in silence during that time for the Gall family and for persecuted Christians around the world. And on the right side of the room, I'll get you to stand, but I'll get you to put your hands behind your back as if you're being handcuffed. Because I really want us to feel in our hearts the physical harm that our persecuted brothers and sisters are enduring and that our our precious golf family is, is enduring okay so left side of the room if you can stand put your hand on your head pray in silence let the holy spirit prompt you and lead you right side of the room handcuffed pray in silence let the holy spirit lead and prompt you 
And I'm going to leave us like this for a minute or two, and then I'll, I'll bring us back together. the Holy Spirit is so powerful and we're just praying for him to move amongst us. You guys can all sit now. And I want us to continue with our hearts fully engaged that way. We've entered in to just explore the power of scripture-based prayer for the Gall family. I've given some prompts there for you. I've given you some prompts for practical needs. Um, I can share um, that all the girls are physically feeling better now and are recovering well from COVID, so we're thankful for answered prayer in that way. Um, we also want to just continue to pray as high anxiety remains for Farouk and for the family. And so with that on our hearts, I'll just ask you to turn into your uh, families um, with your prayer partners and just engage your heart in prayer for the for the golf family. Pray that you'll just continue to pray for the golf family in the weeks and the months ahead as we just long for them to join us. Um, in the prayer corner, we have um, uh, Ben Healy and Taylor Riley, and they've asked us to just pray for them this week as they go through the extreme busyness of the week. And Catherine Charles is our other family of the week, and Lord, I just know her from prayer walks, and Lord, we'll just continue to join together and pray, Lord, that she becomes whole and healed, Lord, and that she continues to, to worship you in, in mind and spirit as well. So we'll just take a moment and, and, and pray in our families uh, for these two members of our family as well. And, and Heavenly Father, our, our other family that we're praying for is Steve Taylor's family.
Beth and Tristan and Brody and Cassie and Ollie and his parents and his siblings. And again, I've given each of us, um, if, if you want, 10 Bible prayers for, for comfort and hope and just um, believing in that the word is living and active and, and, and guiding them. So uh, I'll ask uh, you to do that again in your families or with your prayer partners. And then we're going to come back together and really follow the leading of the Spirit in prayer and have more of a popcorn-style prayer, uh, which is just where if you feel prompted by the Holy Spirit to pray what's on your heart in a, in a sh short way, I guess, Lord, uh, for their family. But let's start in our individual families and, and pray comfort and, and hope to their family and to each other. Well, I know that we've been here for a little while this morning, and I really appreciate your patience. <clears throat> I'd also really appreciate if you just threw your watch away for a little while. And if there's dinner in the oven, that's not my fault. <laughs> I actually do have a bit of a shorter message. So. I just want you to imagine that you're a coach of a professional sports team. doesn't matter what sport it is, but it's the end of the season. You're in the playoffs and your team is down by a few points at the intermission. What do you say to your team? What do you think they need to know to pull off a win in this game? I asked a player that, someone who had been in a few games like this, and this is what she said. I remember my coaches reviewing plays, talking about the other team's strengths and weaknesses and how to play better. They ultimately wanted us to stay focused on what our jobs were on the court as individuals and as a team, as well as to play the best that we can. So when, the, when people were down, when there was a challenge ahead of them, when they were behind, what coaches chose to focus their teams on was stuff they already knew, things that they, they had been focusing on the entire year. These were the things that the teams knew, they knew well, and yet the coaches focused them on those fundamentals. And as we go into a new year with new challenges and, and difficult times, I want to focus us on the fundamentals. And we're not, we're not facing a championship game here today. But emotions are high. And our hearts are broken. And restrictions are creeping back in. And all of the divisiveness that the enemy has sowed in the midst of the church and other places is threatening to come back. Our world's been through roughly 20 months of extraordinary change. And our personal lives have been rocked by tragedy on top of everything else. It's a battle. And it continues to be. Division, distraction, discouragement have been the enemy's tools in our midst, in our hearts, in our minds. And right now, it feels like a Job experience where it's just one thing after another after another. But even as the world changes and the way we handle sickness and disease changes, and even if there's masks and something called a vaccine passport, even though all of these changes are happening, there is something that has never changed, and that is Jesus. Hebrews 13, verse 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And all the world has changed a million times and is likely in for more changes. Jesus has never changed and he never will. And that is a big deal right now. The Bible likens our lives to a race several times. And if this was a race, I'd say that we were on an uphill part of the race as a group and feeling the pain. We're not a professional sports team, but we are a group. We are the body of Christ, we're, and we're hurting. And there's a, there was a lot of hope and excitement for the year ahead, and much of that has changed in just one week. And at times like this, we feel low, and we feel hurt, we feel lost. And at those times, as much as any other time, we need to focus on Jesus and the basics of our faith and what he died to give to us. One of the things I so appreciated and love about Jesus is his willingness to work with rough-edged and ragtag people. His disciples were a bunch of young men with all kinds of silly ideals, misplaced loyalties, passions, and tempers, and yet he worked with them patiently and compassionately, slowly showing them what? 
What did Jesus show his disciples when he worked with them? Love? Absolutely. <laughs> it's more like what he didn't show us, show them. Did he show them how to preach a sermon? No. Did he walk them through the, the best ways to win a soul? No. So what did he teach them? He taught them about the kingdom of God, and he taught them about what God truly values. He didn't teach evangelistic techniques or how to exercise a demon in 10 quick steps. He, told, the, he told, told them and he showed them and he taught them about having faith in God alone and displaying the character that God loves. In fact, he showed them and he shows us that character is far more valuable than competency. The character is more valuable than competency. You don't have to turn there, but I'm going to read to you a little bit from Luke. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 7. The Lord chose 72 other disciples and sent them out in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Don't take any money with you. Don't take a traveler's bag or an extra pair of sandals. And don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Whenever you enter someone's home, say, may God's peace be on this house. If those who are lived there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home. Stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those who work, their work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever is set before you. Heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, Go out into the streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from our feet. So I hope you'll notice that this is Luke 10. This is not Matthew 28. This is not the end of the book of Luke. This isn't the Great Commission. These disciples are just getting to know Jesus. And Jesus says, okay, don't pack your bags. Forget your wallet. Don't talk to anyone. Just go tell people about me. I think not ready is the phrase here. Not ready. And yet, and, and that's probably what they were thinking. Can you imagine the guy who you're following says, don't take any money, don't take any food, don't take any extra clothes, just go down to Gronled and start visiting people and tell them about me. What? And yet they go. And what happens? Take a look at verse 17. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported, Lord, even the demons obey us when you, we use your name. <laughs> what? They were unschooled, ordinary men. And they put their faith in Jesus. They had faith and they were growing in godly character and they accomplished amazing things through the Holy Spirit. I'll speak about this on Tuesday, but this is one of the things I loved best about Steve. He hated leading our service. He was a chore. I cannot tell you the number of hundreds of outtakes he had when he tried to tape himself for, during COVID. And when he got up here, he would hold a piece of paper, a handwritten piece of paper. And what was it doing? But when Steve came up into this pulpit to preach, it was clear that the Lord spoke through him. He was not ready. He was scared to do it. But honestly, he crushed it every time. God used his disciple. God used Steve. God will use you. Many of us would say we are not ready to go and do what these disciples did. And, but we have far, far more knowledge than these disciples ever did. And I believe that we need to grow in our faith and in our character. And so this year, we're going to study that. For 2021, the rest of this year, we're going to study godly character. And then once we hit 2022, we're going to study a man who lived that character out in a rough-edged way, David. We're going to do a sermon series on David and watch how that godly character is lived out day to day. 
But it's not all learning. It's not all book learning about faith and character, right? If it was, we'd be all set because we're good at learning. We're a part of a living organism called the church and we all have a role to play in this place. And that role has very little to do with sitting and listening and everything to do with putting what we know into action, working together with others who are doing the same thing. This is discipleship. It's a combination of learning and doing put together. It's not linear. You don't all of a sudden arrive one day and be like, now I can preach the gospel. It doesn't work like that. It's doing and learning at the same time. It's comprehensive. Serving the, serving the church is essential. It's not optional. You must serve the church. It's not optional in your discipleship with Jesus. He hasn't changed and neither have his methods. He set the church up as a body with everyone having a role and with everyone getting a gift to serve everybody else. These gifts don't expire with age and they don't become valid at a certain time. If you believe in Jesus, you have a gift you've been given and you must use it. And for Park to be an effective church body, we must all be in on this. We as leadership and pastors have lots of roles for you to fill, but it would be silly for us to think that just our boxes are the things that you can serve in. And so if you are looking at all these things that Park is doing and you're still like, I don't fit, come talk to Joe and me. We want to plug you in. We want to help you achieve everything you can be in Jesus while you're here. And this is not me begging for volunteers. This is me saying that your duty as a disciple of Jesus Christ is to serve. Jesus didn't come to serve, sorry, he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Spirit has given you a gift. You have one. You're a part of our body. You're a part of our family. Use that gift. During COVID, we mostly consumed. And we didn't really know what else to do. And I understand that, but those patterns are hard to shake and they, they die hard and we need to crush those things out of our lives. We're not consumers as the body of Christ. We're servants. We serve. We love. We do it together. That's who we are. That's what we do. And I know that there are a group of people, that this group of people is committed to serving one another, to serving the people of this, of this community by helping people in need, visiting the sick, showing people that we want to be like our Savior, who is an example of the humble service to all people, whether they loved him or not. And why do we do this? Because we're on a mission. And Jesus intended us to be a certain way and do specific things for him. And it's time to live into that. The world has changed. And it's constantly changing. But Jesus hasn't changed. And he doesn't. And he won't. Our mission is the same as it always was. And this family of Park Avenue Bible Church needs to be ready, willing, and able to carry out the mission that Jesus has given to us. And you know that mission. But, and even though that's the case, we are going to read that mission out loud and together today. So Levi, if you can take that Matthew 22 passage and get it up on there. All right, why don't you read here with me? Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I've mentioned this before, but this is likely our weak point as a North American church. And we need to take steps to conquer that. And that has never been more needed than right now. We are hurting as individuals, as families. We need each other. Brian and Jody, Kevin and Jody, Steph, Tristan, Brody, Ollie and Cassie, Jack and Becky. Lots of cousins. Lots of friends. In fact, everybody here needs each other, especially right now, but especially the family of Stephen. If you've repented of your sin and you follow Jesus, then your brothers and your sisters are sitting here with you. And we can meet one-on-one -on -one to encourage one another. We can meet as couples. 
we can pour into one another. Go with the mentality of serving and loving and listening to people when you spend time with people. Knock on someone's door. Go on vacation. Take a weekend with a family. Go grab someone's kids and babysit them so mom and dad can have a night out. Meet as a house church. And by the way, we're going to be speaking for the next two weeks on the importance of small groups. Pray together. Play together. Our Body Life Committee basically has one event a month so that we can get together and we can learn about playing with one another and spending time together. This isn't optional. This is commanded. This is crucial. It's part of our witness to Melfort that they would know we are disciples of Jesus by the way we love one another. And so I challenge you to let people in. And I challenge you to dig in. Allow people to ask you questions. Nosy ones. Ask nosy questions. Get into each other's lives. We do not have enough time in this life to spend it alone. Communicate often. Pray all the time for your brothers and sisters. Be in each other's worlds. Invite people in and be open to their involvement in your life. And if they screw that up, forgive them. And continue to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We're going to hurt each other. But that's okay because we are a family and we forgive one another. Church is not Sunday morning. Church is you guys. Church is every morning, every afternoon, and every night. Next, let's read Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are the church, and we are here for a reason. Even more than now than we have, bleh. and now more than ever, we have been reminded of that. The Lord has rung the bell. Who is going to answer? Here at PABC, we are going to make you a disciple. At every level. From having elders in training to putting junior high students working with your kids at the Sunday school level. Everyone who leads something is being told to pass that on and move it into the next generation. And this applies to every single one of us, intentionally and otherwise. If you're spending time together, that will rub off on, on each other. I value all of you women because you speak into my kids' lives and my wife's life. I value all of you men because you speak into my life, into my son's life, and all the other connections across every single person in this church. We have a responsibility to each other. And I want to see that in each one of you. And it takes work, but it's not just discipleship. We're, kinda, we're, we're not great at it, but we're better at it than the next thing, the most essential thing, I think, for the church right now, and that's evangelism. When we start telling people about Jesus and start sharing our testimony about them, it gets risky, right? This is where we get scared. This is where we get nervous because this is where we could lose something, right? This is where you can start getting called a freak or a loser. Kids at school, this is hard because your peers make fun of you. Maybe your teachers belittle you. Adults, you could lose a client over this. You could lose your job over this. And it is hard, and it will cost you. But isn't that why we're here? Isn't that our purpose? Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? He came and told us about himself, and what happened? We killed him. He risked. It cost. And we have eternal life because of that. On Tuesday at Jack and Becky's farm, we're going to gather to remember Stephen. And there's a man who took this seriously. He was out there. He was out on the lakes to get the big one. 
Okay, that's why he was, he was out there for sure to get the big one. But you know what? Every single time he went out there, he sent me and a couple other men a message about the partner he was going to fish with. And we were praying for that guy in the boat every time. And, and, and maybe Steve was out there to get a big fish, but he was also a fisher of men. And he fished for men hard. He took it seriously, and he set an amazing example for us. And it was hard for him. But on Tuesday, we will see just how effective that was as maybe even hundreds of fishermen come to listen to what made Steve the way that he was. And we get to testify to that truth. <laughs> it's hard. And, there's the, and the tough sides of sharing the gospel are many and varied. But the other side of this, the other side, the joy, the real true joy, is that you could be involved in the saving of an eternal soul. You've been given a mission by Jesus himself. And we are the hands and feet and even the voice of Jesus to people. Are we going to take that seriously? There are thousands of people in Melford who do not know the gospel. Does that break our hearts? If it doesn't, it has to. And if it does, let's do something about it. This is something that I will work on as your pastor, yes, but evangelism isn't a program at Park Avenue Bible Church. It's a way of life for believers in Jesus Christ. We must live that. We must step out into that. We must share the love of Jesus in our actions and in our words. And COVID moved a lot of that stuff internally. And it took it off of our radars and we became introverted. But now it's time to look up and look out at the community of people that we live in. We are the workers and we must get to work. And it might be at this point, after all of these things and after all of this time, you're saying, Phil, I actually have a life. I work. I go to school. I've got volleyball and hockey. What you're describing is going to eat up my entire life. Yes. It does. It's our whole life. Jesus gave his life. And we are willing to take his life for our own. but it should consume and must consume all of your life. And as you live and grow in Jesus, the Spirit takes more and more of your life and he makes it your own. And the Bible even says that. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. And that price was the life and blood of the Son of God himself. And we must be willing to, we must be willing to accept that sacrifice and then live into it. We are all in. Christians are all in. And I challenge you this year to sacrifice for the Son of God who sacrificed for you. That's why we say that communion is a celebration. We celebrate the death of the Son because it was for us and it set us free from eternal death and hell. That's our reality and it hasn't changed and it won't change no matter what is happening in the world right now. We are his people on his mission, living his life and being made into smaller copies of himself. Christ is your life. And as we celebrate that today, I challenge you to sacrifice your life for him. Romans 12 says, In view of all this, brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. We've been set free to do his work here in Melfort. Let's take that calling seriously. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for this time that we've had. And Lord, we are going to worship you now again. And Lord, as we, we prepare to leave this place, I pray that you would fill us with love as you are full of love. Lord, I pray that we would be filled with love for each other. That we would supernaturally show that to others. That we would reach out to the Taylor family and bring them in here, Lord. And not just the building that we go to. Lord, may all Christians comfort one another now as we grieve. And Lord, we know that not just this loss, but many other losses plague us and many other changes get into our minds and hearts. And Lord, we are hurting people. We are broken and we need each other and we need you. Lord, please lead us to the people who need our comfort. Please help us to do what you would do. In Jesus' name, amen.
please stand with us. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so So as we close, I just want to tell you that this is not a grim duty. We've had a somber service, and we should, but this is the joy and the privilege of being a Christ follower, that we can spread the love of God through Melfort, through one another, and we can do this with joy in our hearts, and we can enjoy it. If a player is going out to play a professional championship game and he hates what he does, he's not going to win. And we can do this with love and with joy and enjoyment and excitement. And yes, we are hurting right now. And there is pain in the race, but we can do this. 
We can do it because Jesus lives in us. And it's going to be hard work. But here's this, 2 Corinthians 4. We have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be seen in our bodies. We have the Holy Spirit, who is not a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. And if God is for us, then who can be against us? So we say with confidence, the Lord is our helper. We will not be afraid. What can men do to us? Heartache? Yes. Hard work? Yes. And yes, there is an enemy out there, but overwhelming victory is ours in Christ Jesus. Heaven is our destination, and Jesus, who never changes, walks with us and waits for us. Remember that, and fully enjoy the life and mission he has given to us. God bless you. We'll hope to see you on Tuesday afternoon.